we want to make uh, an important contribution in science, we cannot go with the mainstream. We have to go against the mainstream. We have to, to find a unique but important problem, and that's what happened here. Most researchers were interested in how proteins are made. Nobody was interested in the opposite problem, how proteins are degraded. When I was a young uh, postdoctoral fellow and I encountered this problem, I saw that this is an important problem. A protein that has to be degraded is linked to another protein called ubiquitin which is called so because it's ubiquitous, it is in all our cells, and it's there because it has to get linked to the right protein at the right time. So that was the basic discovery. People were starting to tell me, soon you will get the Nobel Prize, but of course you don't believe it until you get it, and it was very gratifying. Gradually, the research community found that it's important, it's important in, in health, also important in disease. And later on, the drug companies also began to get interested because it was uh, clear that it's a drug target. And now it's, it is the mainstream. So now we have to find another subject so I won't be in the mainstream. Daily, when we get up and look at the mirror, we see the same face. As far as the mirror is concerned, very few changes have occurred. However, this is not the case chemically. If along the second day, we would have taken a small, tiny sample of our face tissue and would have sent it to the laboratory and compare it to the same sample that would have taken a day before, the chemist would have sent us a very surprising result. He would have told us that during one single day, between Sunday and Monday, 5% of our proteins have been destroyed, completely disappeared, and have been replaced by new ones. That means that along a period of 20 or 30 days, almost every single molecule of a protein that had been with us a month before was completely gone, destroyed, and was replaced by a new one. My physical body today is not the one that was there a month ago, then who am I anyway? How are my memories preserved? How my intellectual properties, capabilities are preserved? How my emotions are preserved, my ability to love? Furthermore, how is it that within such a dynamic process of destruction and construction, I have been nevertheless able to embed new memories new emotions, and new experiences in my brain. While science of today doesn't have answers to these exciting questions, it nevertheless can answer some other, not less interesting questions. Let's try to answer some of the questions together. The first question is, what are proteins? Answer number one, proteins are the building blocks of the body. They are responsible for the structure and functioning of our body. Answer number two. Proteins are the muscles and bones of our body. Please choose your answer now. The proteins bear total responsibility for the structure and multiple functions of the body. In order to understand the entire system, I think it is the best to compare it to a language. The body is a language. What is a language? A language is a collection of words. The body is a collection of proteins. In the language, we have tens of thousands of words. And in the body, we have tens of thousands of proteins. In the English language, there are 26 letters. And in the protein language, there are 20 different chemical compounds called amino acids. However, there are differences between the spoken and written language and the language of proteins. One difference is in the length of the words. Here, for example, is a model protein. Proteins are our body's engines. This is a very short protein. But nevertheless, we took four different words in the English language and connected them to one another to make one model protein that is much shorter than the average native protein. 
Another difference is in the three-dimensional structure of the words. In the spoken and written language, the words are linear, they are in lines. However, in the protein language, the words are folded in the three-dimensional space, a specific folding that is critically important for their proper function. The next question is, why do we destroy our body's proteins? Answer number one. We destroy our body's junk proteins so that they don't cause harm, and we destroy healthy functional proteins that we no longer need. Answer number two. The proteins must be destroyed so that our body weight does not increase unchecked. Please choose your answer now. We are destroying our body's proteins because of two reasons. The first is, we are removing denatured, misfolded, non-functional proteins, the accumulation of which may cause us damage, may lead to diseases. The second reason is we are removing functional and active protein that we do not need anymore at a certain time point. One of the reasons is the high temperature of our body, 37 degrees centigrade. Take, for example, the meat. When we go to the butcher and buy a fresh piece of meat, we put it in the freezer, or at the minimum, in the refrigerator. If we buy mistake, leave it on the table and go to work, when we come back home, it stinks and we have to throw it away. It is all spoiled. What is the difference between the meat and the flesh in my body? The difference is that the flesh is in a living organism where misfolded proteins can be identified and destroyed and replaced with new ones, while the meat is coming from a dead cow, and therefore the misfolded and denatured proteins cannot be identified, cannot be destroyed, and cannot be replaced with new ones. Here's another question. How does the body recognize the proteins that need to be destroyed? Answer number one, the body has a mechanism to identify and destroy damaged proteins. Answer number two, the damaged proteins are eliminated by the digestive system. Please choose your answer now. There is a specific system in each and every one of our cells that removes proteins that have to be replaced, the ubiquitin proteasome system. The ubiquitin system for destruction of proteins has two main functions. The first is to remove damaged, non-functional, misfolded proteins, what we can call also garbage protein. The second function of the ubiquitin system is to remove functional, healthy protein that we don't need at a certain time point. Once the protein loses its three-dimensional structure as a result of high temperature or irradiation, or it undergoes chemical modification, like oxidation, it starts its degradation process. The degradation is mediated by the ubiquitin system, and it involves two steps. Initially, a molecule of ubiquitin is conjugated to the protein. This is followed by conjugation of a second ubiquitin molecule is conjugated to the first one. A third molecule of ubiquitin is then conjugated to the second one. This process repeats itself many times, and at the end, a polyubiquitin chain made of numerous ubiquitin moieties is being synthesized on the protein to be degraded. This polyubiquitin chain now recruits glues in the scissors, a molecule called the proteasome that comes in and cuts the protein into pieces. The released amino acids are now being used to synthesize new proteins, as if they were letters in words that we put them together to generate, again, new words. When the ubiquitin system doesn't destroy the unneeded proteins, this causes disease. Is it possible to fix the system and cure the disease? Answer number one, we have a partial solution for some of the diseases. Answer number two, there is a complete solution for all diseases. Please choose your answer now.
Unfortunately, we have only partial solution to the problem. Accumulation of damaged, non-functional proteins because the ubiquitin system doesn't get rid of them may lead to development of diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Accumulation of functional, active proteins that have not been removed by the ubiquitin system on time, like proteins that accelerate cell division, can lead to rapid cell division and as a result to malignancies. We started with a theoretical question of how proteins are degraded in cells, and we have never imagined that one of the milestones of our discovery will be a meeting with a dying cancerous patient that his life were saved because of a drug that was developed based on our discovery. To be a scientist, you have to, to be crazy about it. And uh, I am, I am today, when I am doing an experiment, actually I did an experiment until the camera crew came, uh, I am as excited as I was 35 years ago because I have a question, I want to know the answer, and uh, I, I, I'm doing an experiment, and then I'm excited that until, until I, I get, uh, get, get the answer. When I get the answer, of course, I get another question, yes, so, uh, so it goes on and on. So I think basic research should be driven by curiosity, by, by trying to understand how, how things work. It's very personal, but of course, you have to understand that by satisfying our curiosity, we are also contributing to, to the society. Because uh, when we make a discovery, eventually society uh, benefits from it. <laughs>